Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, thanks for coming. Um, so this is uh, Taylor Welsh. Welsh uh, yeah, it really intrigued me, sort of blew me away, actually, this the whole idea that you're up to, so um, I thought it was really cool. So yeah, thanks a lot, Taylor, for agreeing to do No worries. And uh, yeah, and also, I didn't realise you're actually at Plum Food. But, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, you're doing a part-time master's, but yeah, so thanks a lot. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'm Taylor. Um, I'm a technician at Plum Food in Lincoln, and I work with insects. Um, I'm part of a biosecurity group, so most of the insects I work with are things that we don't want here yet. Um, uh, and I've been playing around with electronics for three or four years, mostly because I'm a really lazy entomologist, and I hate sitting in the field with a clipboard or sitting at a bench watching flies mate or, you know, <laughs> all of the really mundane, soul-destroying things that entomologists usually spend all of their time doing. I try and um, automate the data collection with some simple electronics. Um, so for my masters, um, I am working on the idea of an automated um, insect trap. And the main reason for that is that there are a lot of them and they're all checked by hand every two weeks. It's a huge labor force. Um, there's thousands of them all over the country um, in MPI's surveillance network, which these are mapped here. Um, but there's also, you know, thousands more in apple orchards and private, um, private agriculture, and almost none of them are uh, automated in any way. So, <laughs> so someone still has to go and change their lure, change a sticky base, in the trap, um, count how many uh, insects there are, and have a guess at what insects are caught. <laughs> it's often quite difficult to do once they're stuck to a sticky base. Um, and for MPI, uh, they so they just have a, a labour force that's paid minimum wage to go out and check them all. And they're instructed that if they find any insect over a certain size, they have to send it into a lab to be um, to be tested to figure out the species and whether or not it's a, a threat or um, whether it's just some bycatch that doesn't matter. And it's almost always bycatch. <laughs> so large insects bad? Um, no, but it's just the easiest way that they have of sorting oh. the threats. Um, so, uh, yeah, so last year they found 4,000 fruit flies and, well, 4,000 fruit flies that were over the size to would deem them as a threat, but none of them were the one that they were looking for. Um, so that's like hundreds of hours of people in the lab trying to identify them that, you know, it's wasted effort, really. Um, yeah, so um, when it comes to automating uh, insect trap, most people go for cameras. It's the obvious choice, right? You just take a picture of the sticky base, then it's the same as checking it manually, except you can do it from your desk or whatever. Um, but species identification in an image is really hard a lot of the time. So these are fruit flies. This is Drosophila. There's four species there, different species that I've mixed together. And I have no idea of what, which ones of which. I couldn't tell you. Um, we usually use a microscope at work to check our colonies and make sure that they're <laughs> the right species, the ones that we think they are, because it's just they're not very different morphologically. Most of the difference um, in these species comes from their behavior and their geographic location. Um, and so taking a photo, you could probably count them if you had a good machine learning algorithm for um, edge t detection or whatever, but you'll probably also count things like, if I go pointer, yeah, things like this little black splob, which is just dirt, and this is a an egg casing. <laughs> so there's all kinds of little um, bits of crap that get in the trap that could easily look like an insect that aren't. Um, and there's also the issue of um, if you wanted to have a little remote uh, remote trap pitting along on a battery, sending the images over the over a cell network or something like that, it's a heap of data and a lot of power to um, to get you a data source which is not ideal, in all honesty. 
um, and probably someone would still have to go and check the traps manually just to make sure um, that something that looks like it might be a, a threat insect on the image actually is. Um, so um, another method of species identification is through their wing beat frequency. So it only obviously only applies to insects that fly, um, but that's a lot of insects, um, maybe 70 percent. I don't know. I don't know the figure. Um, and the way insects fly is quite diverse, and the the frequency at which they beat their wings is fairly diverse. Um, but more importantly, it's a really easy thing to measure. So um, I'll, I'll go through these gifts because there's a honeybee, and then. There's this thrip up here, which is a very, very, very small insect. It's about it's less than a millimeter across, um, but it uh, has this cap, clap and fling method. Because it's so small, it's more like it's swimming through the air than flying, uh, because you know it has such little mass that gravity doesn't really affect it as much as the friction with the air does. So um, its wings are actually perforated, or they're like hairs. Pretty much, you can see them in the in the photo, and it um, as it flaps its wings, it claps them at the top, which creates a vacuum that pulls it up. Um, yeah, and then obviously there's a winged ant there, and there's a hawk moth down the bottom here, which is, they kind of just bumble around um, really clumsily. You guys know moths? Everyone seen a moth? Hmm? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's quite a lot of diversity in wing beat frequency, just literally the speed at which they beat their wings. Um, and it varies a lot by species. This is just by common name. Um, I've been doing a bit of a meta analysis for my masters on what wing beat frequencies are known, and these are just the averages by the common common family. Um, and there's quite a bit. Um, I haven't got around to plotting the actual, <laughs> but um, especially especially with these lower, these the lower um, lower frequency ones. There's quite a lot of variation in the mosquitoes. There's almost none. It's almost all around here. Um, but uh, yeah, and even yeah between species, there's enough variation that you could tell them apart. Um, Quite easily. Um, oh, and yeah, I mean the wing beat frequency. It's like roughly proportional to the wing area and the mass of the insect, but not quite. That equation explains about 75% of the variation. But there's other things like the um, method at which they are using to fly, and how many wings they have, and all sorts of stuff that contributes to that last 25% of variation. Um, yeah. So this is. Uh, sample of a Drosophila's wing beat. And for a really simple um, piece of data, it has heaps of information in it. Um, so we can just look at the, the literal frequency at which they beat their wings. Um, but you can also plot the frequency spectrum and look at the harmonics. You notice this third harmonic is actually louder than the second harmonic. We see a lot of variation in which harmonic is dominant. Sometimes the the second or fourth even harmonic is louder than the primary one. I don't know. There's like heaps of variation in, um, in uh, the data that we get from, from the insect's wing beats. Um, and so when you like combine all of these different features that you can pull out of it, it becomes quite powerful in terms of um, predictive, um, in terms of predictive power. Uh, yeah. So, like any good idea, I'm not the first one to have it. <laughs> um, people have been recording insects, wing beats, using microphones since 1945. Um, I think actually even earlier than that, but it's, all the papers are in French, so I haven't been able to um, confirm, but maybe even since the 30s. But um, yeah, obviously this is a really bad way of doing it, because sound is a inverse square law force, so the further away you get from it exponentially, your signal decreases and, nothing, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't make a really, really big microphone to pick it up. <laughs> um, 
but optically recording insects is uh, much much easier. Um, so the first person to do this was um, this guy I R Richards at DSIR in Wellington, um, and he just noticed he was measuring some solar cells and noticed that there were these like noise patterns in it that he couldn't really explain. They didn't look like clouds or anything like that. Um, and through careful observation, he noticed it was William Barrow bugs flying over his solar panel. And so he had, he assumed that it was the wing beats that he was seeing in the, in the, um, in the voltage of coming off of his solar panel. Um, and he got that published in, in uh, Science. It was like a three paragraph paper. <laughs> It was just maybe a sign of the times, but um, yeah, good for him. I have no idea. I don't know what his initials stand for, so I haven't been able to track track him down. But um, yeah, I thought that was cool that it was in Wellington that the first person did this. Um, but then in the 80s, um, these guys, Unwin and Ellington, um, built a much more substantial uh, circuit for um, looking at wing beat frequency optically. Um, so it's just a, a photo die with an amplifier and they would just output to an oscilloscope or something like that to measure the, measure the frequency. Um, and this kind of led to a big explosion in the like, amount of data that was available for, how, for wing beat frequency because it was now super easy to measure, right? You could just stick the sensor in a cage full of insects and look at the plot coming off of it. Whereas before, people would use high-speed cameras or, um, uh, like, yeah, yeah. It was much more difficult before, but, you know, since then, there's tons of, um, tons of information on different basic wing beat frequencies, and they almost all use this um, basic circuit. So in their paper, they actually published the entire circuit. This is just a, a kind of, um, just a general diagram of it. Um, and then a few years after that, this guy Aubrey Moore started um, adding some data science into the process. So this is his setup on the side here with, um, he's got a computer now, <laughs> um, taking the data in. And um, he did some early machine learning work and was able to differentiate the species um, of aphid, uh, I think he had four species of aphid and he could differentiate those four species with 80% accuracy, even though two of the um, species of aphid had exactly the same primary wing beat frequency. So that was by looking at all the other features in the data, he was able to still tease them apart. <laughs> yeah. Um, and recently, this guy Amon uh, has started working on this as well. He's a data science uh, data scientist and uh, one of these kind of keen data scientists who just want to consume all the data in the world and <laughs> are busy out there looking for new things to to um, to feed into their algorithms. Uh, he's worked on all kinds of weird stuff like. Um, he was looking at ancient music notation and trying to use machine learning algorithms to decode what the notation meant in terms of notes so that it could be played back in a MIDI file. Um, that's one of the weirder ones that I can think of, but he's done all kinds of stuff, especially with time series, um, uh, time series analysis. He's really good at... Um, doing data science with time series data. Um, and we started working with him back in 2013, I want to say. Um, and he sent us a really basic kit for um, gathering data on uh, bees, I think we were mostly interested in. Um, and it was just a laser and an array of photodiodes, and it was all held together with Lego. It was um, very, very basic, but we were able to get some good, good data from it and see that it was worth, um, worth putting some effort into getting a, uh, an actual device that we could put in a trap um, up and running. Um, yeah, so when we started working on it, the idea was that it would be an open source project, but 
obviously a lawyer or somebody got a hold of this team at um, Amon's team at the University of California, Riverside, and now they've got a patent on it, which has made things a bit tense <laughs> after a few years of working towards a, an open source project. Now it's very closed, um, but hopefully we'll still get something out of it. Um, and this is taken off of there. Um, so Farm Science is a company that they started since getting the patent, and um, this is their idea that they'll have a, a circuit board with a bunch of sensors on, including the wing beat frequency sensor, and they're going to gather um, all kinds of environmental data as well as the data coming off of the insect, and that helps their model predict the species. But the main thing that's been holding this project back for quite a while is that nobody involved in it is an electrical engineer <laughs> or electronic engineer. Um, so Amon's a data scientist. He's recruited a, um, a comms a computer science guy to uh, work full time on the project, but he also hasn't done anything embedded. So <laughs> it's been slow going getting, getting this thing. Um, they think maybe they'll have it this year. But in the meantime, we decided we'll just try and make our own. Um, so that's what I've been working on for my masters. Um, mostly just getting a nice, simple, clean sensor that doesn't use too much power. It's been the, um, the thing that's really plagued us for a long time is power consumption from the emitters on the sensor and um, noise from I don't know what. <laughs> um, we've always seemed to have problems with noise from power supplies and things like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, the more features you can collect, better your classification can be using Bayesian classifiers. That's what um, we've determined the best model is to use. Uh, early work was using neural nets, but they're just way too complicated. Um, and you need massive data sets to have predictions that you can rely on. Um, so it's like it's quite hard for us to get a, a million samples of insects flying through our sensor. It would take a long time, especially if we need to guarantee that it's an insect that we are interested in flying through the sensor. Um, so algorithms that work with small, work okay with small data sets are what we're focused on. Um, yeah, so this is uh, an example of a few data sets plotted out and the variation that um, you can see there. We've got three different species. Obviously the mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, are very different from Drosophila and um, oh, just a housefly. Um, but these two are like, in terms of their primary wing beat frequency, are really similar. But um, by looking at um, that like, massive amount of features that we can pull out of the data, um, I think there's something like 20 features that they use in their algorithm. But I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. But it's things like, um, the frequency spectrum and how um, how far those harmonics that uh, were on that slide before how far these harmonic peaks differentiate from each other so whether or not they're like true harmonics or um, whether they've they're distorted a little bit um, gives you a lot of information um, and also things like how long it takes the insect to pass through the sensor, so the period of the wave. And um, what else? Uh, yeah, so there's this idea of tri stimulus. Have you guys heard of that? So it's a, it's mostly mostly talked about in terms of color theory. The idea that you just mix colors and you can make any color by mixing colors because of the way that the optic nerve. Um, feeds the data into your brain. Um, but the same same theory is around for sound. And so the idea is, you know, if you hear a, a piano play middle C and a saxophone play middle C, you can easily tell the two apart. It's, they're not even remotely the same sound. But it's exact same frequency. But there are all of those um, subharmonic features and um, distortions in the waveform that give it its character. Right? Yeah, tamba is the 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 term, um, and we think we can we have the same information in this optically sensed data um, that we can use to to uh, make accurate predictions. So even though 
these uh, these two insects have very, very similar primary wing beat frequencies, we were able to tease them apart with an accuracy of 95% with really, I mean, this is a thousand insects, it's quite a small data set, um, and especially in terms of machine learning algorithms. Um, yeah. So we've been plotting along for a while, collecting data, um, and a lot of it has been really shitty quality. So I have stopped collecting data in the field now because I get too many different species coming into the trap. And so I, you know, if I have a thousand samples, I have no idea how many of them are the, the species I'm interested in. Even if I can, you know, I can count how many insects are in the trap, but um, you don't know if an insect just buzzed on the front of it for, <laughs> for a few minutes before it decided to go in or, you know. Um, seen it happen. So now I collect all my data in a wind tunnel. Um, I release only one species of insect and I film the, tra the trap while I'm collecting the data so I can be sure. I can look at each um, like time stamped piece of data and go back to the, the video footage and make sure that, oh yeah, that was definitely this and this is how it was flying into it. So we're building this kind of really deep data set for, um, for classifying the insects. Um, yeah, and I thought I'd throw in my schematic for comment because I'm not an electrical engineer, even though I'm doing this. This master's, my background is in biology, so circuit theory is something that I'm learning very quickly. Um, so this is my trans impedance amplifier for the photodiode. Um, so I'm trying to build it to be as simple as possible while still giving me enough gain and a nice clean signal. Um, so it's it's got nothing fancy on it. I mean, I'm even thinking of getting rid of this um, RCP here, um, which is just there to prevent any um, current leaking into that into that input and offsetting the the signal. Um, but honestly, I think I might like to have a little bit of offset because at the moment it looks like the MOSFET is, I mean, the op amp is, um, is saturating while full, so it, it takes a disproportion disproportionate amount of like blocking the light to get it from being at full voltage to, you know, 1% below full voltage than it does to go further than that. Um, so I think feeding a little bit and it's probably probably helpful and it will get rid of a couple of extra components that I don't have to put on the board. Um, yeah, and I was hoping to demo it, but having issues, unfortunately, as of about half an hour ago. <laughs> My emitters have stopped. Um, so, so, unfortunately, I don't have a demo for you guys. But, I mean, you can imagine what is going on, hopefully. Um, I just get a, a voltage and it it drops based on how much you block the sensor, right? And if it's a large insect, it's going to have a bigger amplitude. If it's a small insect, it's going to have a small amplitude. Um, and fluctuates with the beating of the wings. I mean, that's, it's, all in all, it's a really simple concept that with, you know, the right finesse can solve a quite complicated problem. Cool. Um, so that's all I got. Questions? Anyone? So, so I was reading, it's just funny, you should, so I was reading this thing just the other day about these guys in California that have built a thing for uh, killing mosquitoes. So it's the same same team, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they, um, what they do is they bathe the area with a laser light and then measure the reflection off the wings of the laser. Mm. And yeah, they, yeah. They reckon paper that they could tell the difference between male and female mosquitoes because they're slightly different in the, the wing beat. So I wonder if some of the, your variations are because you've got mixed genders in there. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, even stuff like, um, so in honeybees, uh, older foragers, their like, wings get pretty munted by the end of their life. So they'll, you know, have a different, a different signal to a young forager that's fresh out of the hive. So there's like, yeah, explanations for a lot of that variation. It's not really just random, um, random noise. Yeah, it was interesting that they were able to tease the, the um, male and female apart. But I mean, with mosquitoes, they beat their wings so fast that there's so much room for 
variation in the recordings. With something like a moth, I mean, I'm getting maybe 50 hertz um, as their wing beat frequency, and it's just not not much room to move around below there without getting you to the into the decimals. Um, yeah, so we've worked with um, a team. I'll see if I can find a photo for you guys. A team based in Montana who have been detecting honeybees on the landscape using a LiDAR for a long time, and they, they filter the signal with using wing beat frequency. Um, and it's, it's an interesting piece of technology, but um, but it uh, cost about 300,000 US dollars to build. Um, and the geography one, they got the geography got one on our roof at the moment. Mm. Three thousand meters one. Speaks. Oh yeah. Lidar. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can buy a lidar unit for fairly cheap. Like you get one from a, a autonomous vehicle or whatever for a hundred bucks. But having the resolution to look at an insect is is what makes it expensive. I think you need quite a fine beam, and it needs to stay fine <laughs> um, as you go out. Um, Oh yeah, so usually, so this is a delta trap. This is what we use for moths. Um, and inside there would be, a, I haven't got one in here because it's a pain in the ass, but there would be a sticky base and um, and they get stuck. Well, the theory is that all of the insects that fly in and get stuck, but we have no idea how many actually do get stuck versus how many go in. Nobody's ever collected that data because, you know, you can only convince so many people to stare at an insect trap for hours on end. Um, so this is what they look like when they've got a whole bunch of stuff stuck on them. Um, so you can see it's, you can kind of, there's a couple of different, no, there's male and female um, moths stuck here. So these, I think, are males and these are females. But like, I took this with my 12 megapixel SLR and like, it's hard to tell <laughs> what these species are, species are. So you can imagine if you're just using a, a little camera module from a phone or whatever on your on your trap it might be even more difficult to figure out species but maybe not for a machine learning algorithm um, Are you aware of any people doing it with machine learning algorithms for pictures? Yeah, heaps of people are working on it um, Damn, I don't have any photos um, I think last time I counted there were about six companies who are building camera traps, and but none of them are really being used, um, mostly because because their hardware is really expensive. Um, almost all of them have gone for the business model of like leasing yeah. the hardware out to people, um, and farmers hate that, uh, especially. Um, there are a couple which they retain ownership of the images as well as the. The hardware, <laughs> so you you have you lease and you have access. I mean, they'll put some traps on your farm, but um, but you don't own the images. And if you say want to want to cancel your subscription, then your access to all your data is gone. So they're like, I think, um, fairly uh, aggressive business strategies have held back camera traps for a long time. Um, I don't seem to have a photo of their lidar on here. Is an interesting piece of technology. Because the one line that uses two units, so I imagine it would be able to use measure one beam as well. Sorry, I yeah. yeah, I mean, it could. the same system. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you could be measuring turbul turbulence by averaging it over a large distance, right? Um, yeah. Actually, no, yeah, you know what? Yeah, the Taylor yeah, yeah, yeah. But the um, yeah, the team in Montana, their lidar unit is it's um, just a really fine, fine beam. Even at a kilometer, it's only about ten centimeters across. Um, and uh, yeah, they just use it to scan across, and um, instead of having it on like a rotating base or whatever, they just step it using the stepper motor. Um, 
across um, and then they've just written some fancy software that lets them step it across randomly and then fill in the gaps if they missed the last time which speed things up a, little, a bit but it's still it's a really expensive and really slow and really like clunky piece of technology that um, I can't see anybody really using uh, in a practical way anytime soon. They developed it for detecting landmines land so they were training the honeybees to find the landmines and then they needed a way to find the honeybees so they spent millions of dollars on this lighter. <laughs> And it's all funded by DARPA, so um, we've been trying for years to get them to bring the bring the lidar over, but it's just you know bureaucratic hell trying to move a piece of military-funded technology outside of the states. Sorry, you had a question. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering how the 2D nature of optical sensors factors in. Like, you're trying to do the side yeah, so mostly just to differentiate it from a camera, right? So it's it's like I'm using a um, in a like a optical sensor in a camera, but I've only, only got one row of pixels. Yeah, yeah and I'm sampling them a lot faster. <laughs> um, so it's 2D in the sense that I have this plane that I'm looking at. Um, I could make it add more dimensions um, to it. There's a group in group in Greece working on the same or same problem, and they've used a, um, an optical. What do they call it? It's like the diffuser on the back of an LCD. They're using it in reverse as a to concentrate light down to a, a plane, so that gives them, you know, a lot bigger area to sen sense the insect flying across. But um, to keep things as simple as possible, I just want the fine point to look at. I think that's plenty. Um, still get the still get enough data, I think, to make a pretty good judgment on what species has flown in, and definitely enough to know that something has flown in. Yeah. So your aim is to just categorise the number of insects that are floating around in a long or something? Yeah, yeah, to have like a, a remote like um, solution for counting insect populations. Just, yeah. yeah, mostly because, um, so the reason that we have that big biosecurity network is that if you can catch an incursion either even on like on a farm or like on a nationwide scale if you can catch it where there's only a few individuals it's really easy to eradicate them and deal with the problem there but you have to catch them super soon so like it almost increased the costs involved in an eradication increase exponentially with time <laughs> um, if you can get on, get onto it in the first like week or two weeks then it's like a matter of a couple of hundred thousand to eradicate but it becomes millions very very quickly after that um, and for a farmer, you know, if you can, if you know just one corner of your field has like aphids or um, moths in your apples or whatever, then you can just spray that one corner and deal with the problem <laughs> there rather than having to spray your whole orchard or... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, nobody wants to do that again. No, no we're banned, banned from spraying any cities now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so MPI is really keen on getting some kind of automated something. Um, they've been really bad at giving us a spec of what they actually want for a long time. But, uh, but we think this is um, simple enough that we can make it on the cheap and that it won't use too much power. We can put a small battery, it'll last for a long time. Um, and then it'll give them the data that they want and not you know, more data than they need. They honestly weren't really all that interested in the species identification aspect of it, even though I think that's the most interesting part of it, um, because they're a bureaucratic organisation and they have guidelines that they have to follow, so if we detected an insect and gave a good prediction that it was a like insect that was on the threat list, they'd still have to go to the trap and take it out and send it to a lab and have it analysed, the DNA analysed to make sure that it was actually the insect that <laughs> was, even though we could give them, you know, a really good prediction based on wing beat frequency, but that's that. That's not going to change anytime soon. It's like all about um, all about trade agreements and things like that. So far too much inertia to move on that. Yeah. Hey, so uh, a couple years ago we had a, a third pro um, project. I don't know, Mike Hayes supervised. Yeah, yeah. Sure yes. That. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, is that useful? Uh, um, yeah, I, we've taken some. Um, some of the concepts that they developed 
and we're applying them um, in this, in my masters I'm applying a lot of them. So an interesting um, idea that they had is that they were going to monitor all of the, the photodiodes in the sensor or, um, individually. So I don't know if you can see, but I have like eight photodiodes across the opening of this. And um, before we were just summing the signal from all of them, so we you know we'd only have to worry about one ABC port per entrance. Um, but they had the idea of actually sampling all of them individually, so that we can look, you know, instead of just getting that um, that uh, signal um, from the one sensor, you'd get an array of signals. As it transfers over, you know, the distance across this way, um, and we could use that to predict the size of the insect really accurately, I think. Um, but it does make things a lot more difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it's a super hard project, um, and uh, yeah, it's been plagued by a long for a long time by nobody no really knowing what they were doing. You know, working on it. So when we first started, we had uh, a photo transistor array and a red laser, and um, we would just sample off the photo transistors with a voice recorder. It's like a really cheap analog to digital converter, um, and I mean it worked. You could listen back to the recording. And you could say, "Oh yeah, that's definitely a B or whatever," but it was so noisy and like um, you get because we were using red instead of infrared, which is what we're using now. You get like all kinds of noise from the sun and. Um, shadow is passing across the the sensor and things like that. Um, but yeah, hopefully now that I've got my case as a supervisor and I can have a meeting with him every week, <laughs> um, we can get something a bit more reliable um, and start collecting data faster. It's fine. But uh, as far as the setup, uh, because you do it in the tools, right? You're going to do experimental setup to collect all of these uh, insects. Uh, and then you have all of this problem of making sure that you're looking at the, the right uh, uh, insect that you are interested in. Uh, why do you need to go through all of this trouble to, to collect these insects from nature, where you can, uh, you can, you can uh, I guess, trap any one of these insects in a controlled environment in a lab. So you have to worry about getting them stuck uh, there, <laughs> separating them, taking a photo, taking... Why can't I just go and uh, trap some of these insects and put it in a, like you showed a picture from one uh, group of people where they, they, I think they had this uh, trap mm. where they were probably doing experimental things. So why can't you reproduce a more or less similar kind of environment and not go through all the trouble that you're going through? I'm sure um. there's no... Yeah. Collect, trap, so the reason. Yeah. So for some insects, um, just getting them into a container and having the sensor like you know across the container works fine. Um, you get like signal like a lot of data really quickly, and it's usually fairly good quality. But um, for insects like moths, it doesn't really work uh, because moths won't fly in an enclosed space. So um, to the point where I have this really big wind tunnel at our work, um, and I'm trying to get it to come up on the thing, but it seems to have decided it doesn't want to anymore. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... Mm. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned but maybe you have a wind tunnel, so you let them move from one section to another section so that you don't need to trap them necessarily. I mean, um, so we're trapping them. So the reason I'm collecting data at the trap and not just having a like really large array of photodiodes across the entire wind tunnel is that their behavior as they approach the trap is different to when they're just free flying. 
So sometimes they'll glide into the trap, sometimes they'll land on the trap and walk in. So we need to like a good idea of what the signal looks like at the trap because that's where we're going to be collecting the data in the field um, when we eventually you know, put them out on the network. Um, and the second consideration is, yeah, the, the moths don't really like flying in an enclosed space, even in this big wind tunnel that we have. Um, it's been really hard getting them to fly. I catch maybe 10% of what I release and the 90% that I don't catch just walk along the bottom of the wind tunnel <laughs> and never never even try and fly. Um, insects are really difficult uh, and you can't rely on them to behave the way that you want them to just because, it, you know, logic dictates that they would. So um, so that's the main motiv motiv motivation for trying to get, collect the data in the field because it's really easy. I could get um, I could catch 300 moths in a day in one trap out in the field really easy, but it would take me weeks to collect that data in the wind tunnel, even though I would know for sure what each of the insects was. Um, but uh, that is the approach I'm taking now. I, I buy moths. Um, I get 200 of two species shipped every week, and then I fly them in the wind tunnel. <laughs> um, Yeah, yeah. No, so we have a much more controlled okay. data collection stream now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I buy the buy them from a um, from a factory, <laughs> moth factory. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the best moths that I've got came from a factory in Canada, but I have stopped receiving shipments now because um, they won't ship me 200 and. Uh, earlier in the year. So in um, in Hawke's Bay we have this big sterile insect project with um, codling moths. We're releasing something like a million sterile sterile codling moth a week um, in the area and as, as a result they've pretty much eradicated the native population of moths in that area. Um, and I was just hide, like piggybacking on the back of that. So they were getting a million, a million a week and I was <laughs> taking 200 of those. <laughs> um, now I get them from Auckland and they're not as good, but, uh, um, and they're much more expensive, but, yeah, yeah, I actually, the codling moth we were getting was so bad that I asked them to restart the, the colony, because I, like, I would release 200 moths and I'd catch one, and it was, you know, and a lot of them never even, so I, I have them in a bag. Um, and then release them in the bag. None of them even made it out of the bag a lot of the time. So, so yeah, they've restarted the colony with a fresh, um, with fresh insects, and it seems to be they're a lot more fit and willing to fly now. So that's good. I think that colony had been running for about six years without any new genetic material being added. So those moths hadn't had to fly <laughs> for a really long time <laughs> as a population. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of things, a lot of small details that you have to take into account. Yeah. Well, one more, we're going to get a copy of it. Yeah. My second comment, uh, I agree with your statement that more features is better. Mm. Some people may you know, take a, a point with that statement because more is not necessarily better. The thing is how to optimally mm, yeah, select yeah. the features. The question is uh, optimization Mm. So, um, yeah. I that as a caveat that uh, more is not necessarily better. And yeah, for sure. Can you have your machine learning methods uh, get past the optimizing concept as opposed to extracting knowledge and information from the mm. data? So, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. In terms of how to select those features set. Mm, that's true. So, um, a good example of that is. Um, Amon is fixated on this idea that he wants to know whether an insect is going in or out of the trap. So he wants to have two rows of sensors and you know be able to see if it was A, B or B, A that came in the order that it came through. Um, and that gives it maybe like 1% better 
accuracy on the prediction, but it doubles the power consumption of the trap. <laughs> so, exactly. I mean, with with any insect trap, you have um, competing um, elements of you want it to be as easy as possible to fly into, and then also like you know stop them from getting out. But um, the more you know you put around trapping them in, the less you catch total. Um, so these these delta traps I think are a real good compromise. Usually they don't have this. This I've just added this so that my sensor is all aligned nicely. Um, but they're really open and they have just a sticky base and they rely on the fact that the moth is probably going to plow down onto the sticky base as soon as it gets in there. Um, but nobody knows whether or not that's exactly what they do. I've definitely seen some fly out. <laughs> yeah. So at the moment it's two weeks, but ideally we want to get that much longer um, because otherwise there's no point in us. I mean, if, if it still needs to be checked every two weeks, then it's the same cost to MPI that it would be normally. Um, so these, I mean, they use a slightly different delta trap, but these are in the field for five months a year, I think. And so if we can get it one to last five months, that'd be great. But um, they also need to change the lures every Two months, I think. So have they been transmitting data wirelessly or storing it locally? Um, I think we need to transmit it wirelessly. I don't think that would accept storing it locally because we need, you know, the the real time yeah. element of it to, you know, make it make fiscal sense <laughs> for MPI. Um, yeah. So there's another project, a B3 project, that's being run by Scott Hardwick at Ag Research, and he's looking at what networks to use and all the all that stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, it looks like LoRa might be a go once they figure out what they're going to do with it. I don't know. It all seems up in the air at the moment, what frequencies they're going to use and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah. So we're not... I'm making it fairly agnostic, network agnostic, with the, with the hope that I'll just 